Okay, great. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here, be here in person. Um, my name is Charles Eckel. I work at Cisco. I'm in our Global Technology Standards Group. Uh, so I obviously work a lot with standards. But uh, I also, partly because I'm passionate about open source, but also because, as many of you probably see, there's, there's a lot of ties between standards and open source. And we've heard some talks about that um, here this week. And so I deal a lot with open source. And um, there's a lot of passionate people doing quite a lot of good things with open source inside of Cisco. This talk is a little bit about how um, GitHub really empowered and enabled this community of sometimes different siloed groups, not siloed intentionally, they just had different things they were working on and, and ways about going and open sourcing things. And I think in that excitement and using GitHub as a very, you know, as a great tool for sharing code, uh, the way that kind of happened organically within Cisco. And some lessons that, that I learned and that others learned from that and some, some improvements we've made. So just wanted to, to share some of that with you and uh, hopefully get some help with ideas for uh, good improvements that are still easy for us to, to make on top of what we've done. So I'll start by talking a little bit about our, our goal and then the, the reality of, of what happened as we you know, started using GitHub. Um, and then I'll dive into a bit more detail of our usage of GitHub, the various functionality in it, and how we made use of it, and things we kind of learned along the way that maybe we hadn't anticipated or, or where we thought, wow, okay, we, we could do a little better here. And then I'll just close with um, some, some next steps, because we've certainly made some improvements, but there's a, there's a lot left to do. So just, just very simply, what we really wanted was a way to collaborate on code with um, the entire developer community that um, was involved with, with Cisco products, with our APIs. Um, primarily, we were thinking of open source. But as you'll see, it, it didn't even necessarily need, need to be open source. But this collaboration with, with developers was really uh, the goal. And, and many different teams had that in mind. What ended up happening, partly because of the ease of use and availability of GitHub, was many groups went off and just started doing this uh, on their own, which in some ways was fantastic. But um, it also resulted in literally dozens of uh, Cisco GitHub orgs, different variations, different groups of Cisco. Uh, they were all legitimate, um, meaning that um, you know, at least there were dozens that were legitimate. Maybe there are some that weren't. Um, but quite often, there, there wasn't a description of you know, why did this GitHub org even exist? Uh, some of these had a lot of very, very good projects in them. Others kind of started and, and stopped. Someone had an idea and then lost interest, and they were just kind of dormant. Um, many of the repos that were out there didn't have a license. And I think maybe the worst thing was it often was not clear at all who to contact if you had a a question I wanted to find out more. Even for me, working within Cisco, I often didn't know who to talk to. Who set up this GitHub org? I, I don't know. So now I'm going to start by just looking at orgs and repos. First thing, a GitHub organization. I'm sure you're all familiar with this. We see it with open source projects a lot. A GitHub organization just provides a, a really convenient way for a group of people to collaborate on a, a set of, of projects, on a set of repos. Uh, you have some owners who can set things up in, in a certain way. There's a lot of flexibility there. I think the, thing, the key thing here was that, that it's free uh, for an unlimited number of collaborators working on an unlimited number of um, uh, public repos. And, and that in itself was just very empowering, and that's why so many people went off and did this, because they could, it was free, it was easy, and they were off and running. Um, so the, the problem, though, was we had this, this organic kind of mismatch of things. And so we started to look at it, and it was confusing to us. We figured it's certainly confusing to our developer community. Um, and so we started thinking about what are we going to do to make this better? And one thought was, well, we have a dozen of orgs, but should there really just be one GitHub org for all of Cisco? And we thought, well, first of all, we'll probably never be able to achieve that. But second of all, there's sometimes really good reason to divide things up into different uh, GitHub orgs. 
And so we thought we're not going to try to reduce them necessarily. What we're going to do is focus on governance and have clear governance behind each one, behind each GitHub repo, and make sure that the, all of the, the repos, all the repositories that are in a, a particular GitHub org follow that governance. And that way, we weren't going to even try to unify on the governance. We just said, have a governance, and then follow that for your GitHub org and for your repos. And I was in the, uh, the, the DevNet team at Cisco at the time. That was our, really our, our developer outreach kind of team. And so I was uh, one of the owners of the, um, the DevNet org. And I had some close colleagues who were um, owners of the Cisco org. And we thought, well, let's at least start with those two. And so with the, the, the DevNet org, we put up a very simple description of, of what it was we were trying to do. It's a place for us to collaborate with, with the community on, on sample code and various projects that are used in some way with, with DevNet. So it was very broad, but yet told you a bit about what we wanted to do. Um, we have an email alias where you can easily contact us. And then we just verified that we actually own the, or, you know, authoritative for the, the domain developer.cisco.com. So you knew this was legitimate. So when you see like all of these many uh, Cisco GitHub orgs, at least this one, you knew, okay, uh, we, we know what it's about and we know it's legit. So the other one I mentioned, the, the Cisco uh, GitHub org, this one was a bit more general purpose, just uh, as it says here, open source projects from Cisco systems. Um, at least you have some idea what it's there for. Uh, you have a person you can contact. If you know uh, Fluffy, he's very responsive, he's passionate about open source, you'd get a good answer from him. Again, verified that, that we own the cisco.com domain. Just so, again, you get a, at least a little bit of assurance of, of who you're talking to. And so this just solved our initial problem of not knowing who to contact if you had a question about what this GitHub org was about. And hopefully the description even helped you have at least a, a good clue of what it was about. So a step in the right direction. The next thing we thought we needed to figure out and make clear was, well, what's appropriate for one versus the other? This is both for our internal users who will be contributing to it, but for, for external audiences as well. We said, well, the Cisco DevNet one, we will use that primarily for small uh, projects. It's a sample code where we're trying to illustrate, the, like, here's an example of how to use one of the APIs of one of our products as an example, or an integration between some of our products and someone else's um, product. Whereas the Cisco GitHub org, this would be for larger projects um, that, aren't, that, that actually have value outside of Cisco. We're, we're starting them, we're running them, we're maintaining them, but, but we feel and in many cases know that there's people outside of Cisco who outside of using any Cisco product find them very valuable as well. And we really expect and want people outside of Cisco to contribute. And because of the significance of these projects and the contribution model, we also keep, um, and the fact there's, there's fewer of them, we keep closer tabs on them, right? And we really um, think a bit more proactively about community of each of these individual projects or repos. The next thing is, is public versus private. And I'm going to talk about this in relation to repos, but also in terms of uh, people, because I think there's sort of an interesting phenomenon. Um, what you have to keep in mind is that when you're looking at a GitHub org, if you're not a member of that org, you see a different version of it and a different number of things than people who are a member of it. So when you are a member, you kind of may have the false sense that everyone sees what you see. Uh, as an example here, look, what I'm showing now is what a a member sees, it was when I was logged in, but then if a non-member comes, they see something a bit different. And one of the governance aspects that we put in place as well for the Cisco DevNet org and for the Cisco org too, all of the repos we have there should be eventually be um, public. So we, we don't really plan on having any private repos. If they're meant to be private, they they don't really belong in these GitHub orgs. We have other things. We have enterprise GitHub. We have other ways of keeping code internal. Don't, don't mess with a, a private repo on GitHub um, if that was what your intention is. 
So yes, it might be private for a little while, but it should become public. And if you look at the two versions here, you'll see that we have, what is it, 681 repos total, and 673 are, are public. So a non-member sees almost as many. So we actually are doing a good job. I can tell you a few years ago, uh, we were not doing as good a job. I'd say close to half of our repos were actually private. Um, so we've cleaned that up a lot. One thing that's still a bit odd here is you see we have 210 people in our org. But if you're not a member, you only see 12 people. And that's despite me like kind of trying to ask people, hey, the, the default is when you, you join an org, you're, you're, you're private, and you kind of have to choose to make yourself public, which is probably good from a, a privacy point of view. But it's, it can really make complicate things when people want to contact you and reach out to you. Uh, and in fact, what you'll see sometimes is a GitHub org that has a lot of members, but all of them are private. And so for you, a non-member, you'll see zero people. And if they didn't provide an email alias or some other way for you to contact them, you also can't see any of the people who are involved. So you're kind of stuck in terms of trying to figure out why does this thing exist and, and how can you learn more? Okay, next, just a, a brief discussion of, of membership and permissions. So GitHub, you probably know this, has, has uh, different roles. You have owners, members, and outside collaborators. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about how we've used them and, and kind of evolved our use of them. Now, as, a, as an owner of a GitHub org, you're basically a super user. It's like root privilege. Uh, you can do everything and anything within that GitHub org. So when we first started out, um, whenever anyone wanted to add a new repo or change anything, uh, it's like, okay, I'll make you an owner. So we ended up just having, almost everyone was an owner. Um, we had people who weren't even at Cisco who were owners or who were owners and then ended up you know, uh, leaving Cisco and going doing something else. Um, nothing awful came as a result of this, to be honest, but it, we realize that that isn't really right. It's kind of just lazy. And, and while it's empowering to let everyone do everything, that's probably not a good practice, especially as, as things start to grow. So we have reduced it. We still have a little over 20 owners, which I would say is arguably too many. And, and we should really try to reduce it more to just a few, like three or five. But at least they're all Cisco employees who are, have good ties to, to the DevNet group. And also, we made uh, two-factor authentication mandatory if you're going to be an owner. And this gives us a little bit better sense that you know, someone's account isn't going to get hacked in there, um, and bad things happen to our GitHub org. So we're not great here, but we're better than we were. Now, a member, this is the default role in GitHub. And by default, all members all, yeah, members have access to all of your private repos. Um, they're able to see all of those. But now remember, we don't really want to have private repos to begin with. Um, and initially, everyone who wasn't an owner actually was a member and had access to all those private repos. And we weren't very diligent about, well, should they really see our private repos? Are they a Cisco employee? Are they not? Did we just, they just contributed something, so we made them one. Maybe they shouldn't see these private repos. Um, so now what we're trying to do is make you a member only if you have a need to see these private repos. And if you think about it, uh, there should be very few private repos, so there should be very few people that really need to see that. So we're, we're, we're using members less and less. We still have about 150, but again, we've, we've reduced that. And, uh, and I think it would also be good if, if we forced all of the members to have uh, two-factor authentication. But so far, we've just asked for that. We haven't enforced it. And then the, the third role is an outside collaborator. And I didn't even understand what this was at first, um, but now I'm a big fan of it. And um, we will make, like basically anyone who wants to contribute something um, doesn't even need to be an outside collaborator, but where it is really handy is I can create a new repo for someone. I don't even need to make them a member of our org. I can, and yet I can make them an admin of that repo and really empower them to do everything and anything with that repo. And, and they just become an outside collaborator. And so they don't see any of the private repos. 
Um, this is a great way for me to work with people who are not Cisco employees, who have no need to see our private repos, and yet let them have uh, vast rights with the repo that they are the admin for. So we started making use of this a lot, and you know, so we have more than 500, uh, and that's great. And the one thing is I, I, I wish we could get them all to have two-factor authentication too. So in, in summary, with permissions, um, for us, the level of a repo, that's our main guardrail. We've actually turned off the GitHub default that says members can create new repos, and we said only owners, those 20 odd people, can uh, create new repos. Now, once we create a repo, then we give very broad, in some cases, very broad uh, rights to it to someone who may not even be a Cisco employee by making them an admin. And, uh, and this has worked out great for us. Um, so I, I think it's a practice that, at least for now, we, we, we plan to continue. Okay, now shifting gears to contribution. Um, we're here at an open source conference. Obviously, uh, we want people to uh, contribute. So it's very important to welcome and encourage contribution. And uh, as I mentioned before, you, you don't need to be a member. You don't even need to be an outside collaborator to, to contribute. And because contribution can take many forms. And it could be as little as starring a repo, um, submitting a clarification for a readme, uh, sending in a, a pull request. Um, all of these are ways of contributing. And what we try to stress is for your repo, make sure that you let people know how you want them to contribute. Uh, most people are willing to contribute the way you want them to, if, but you have to tell them how you want them to contribute. So we really emphasize having a, a contributing file in your repo or putting the equivalent information in, in your readme. And it, before you contribute to someone's repo, make sure you've read their contributing file and, and contribute uh, accordingly. That will just reduce a lot of that like initial friction that may happen and, and lead to you contributing in a way that's rewarding for you, but also expected by the project. The other thing is a code of conduct. And this is a very simple ask of people, but it's also very important. So we stress that you, sh you should state your code of conduct uh, in your repo, because we really want to foster a welcome and open environment in which everyone's able to uh, participate in a hassle-free, uh, very positive uh, way. And so we provide a, a sample code of conduct, which you know, we think works pretty well. You don't have to adopt that, but you know, we kind of say you, you should have that or something kind of like it, uh, just to create that, that, that good atmosphere. And then what we did was we put these files, the contributing file, the code of conduct, and, and then a readme that um, illustrates what we think a good readme looks like, all the points you should try to cover in your readme, an example of a, a license so people are aware of how, how that works. And, and how to add that to a repo. We put all of that in this template repo. And, and we put this up as an example for people to be able to use. They, they, they can clone it. Um, they can run a script where they answer a few questions and then they get an auto, uh, that automatically creates a customized version of it and sets up their, their repo um, with, you know, just uh, with these things in place, right? A good readme where they can just fill in the blank essentially the code of conduct and, and whatnot. And so we're just really trying to make it easy for people to do the right thing, which you, you'll find out most people actually want to do the right thing if, if you can help them, and especially if you can make it easy. OK, now moving to licensing and copyright. I'm not a lawyer. I know just you know, enough to, uh, to kind of get myself into trouble sometimes. So I'm not going to go into any depth here. Um, but just to, to let you know, a very broad level, we, we try to use two different licenses the majority of the time, either like a BSD three clause license or really an MIT license too. Those two we use kind of similarly for, for these small projects. Most of the ones that I mentioned we have in the Cisco DevNet GitHub org tends to be that you know, a very simple, clear, concise uh, license that, that gives you sufficient permissions to use it and do with it what you want is sufficient. So 
Um, of course, we, we may alter that based on the dependencies you use and, and other licenses that, that are involved with those dependencies. But by and large, for these smaller projects, we use BSD or sometimes MIT. Then for the larger projects, the projects that I was mentioning are more typical of the Cisco GitHub org, there we usually do Apache. And we go with the Apache license just because it, it provides uh, a bit more structure and some of the things that make it easier for collaborators outside of Cisco to feel comfortable with collaborating, that that's a, a safe environment, and for us to accept their contributions too. So we usually don't go with that for some of the really small projects because we just don't feel it's, it's, it's worth the, uh, um, the added complexity, but we do that for the larger projects. And this is just as a, a general rule. Now, the one thing that uh, I do want to stress, and this is actually a simple thing, but it happens all the time, is uh, people mess up on the copyright. <laughs> and as much as I love the, uh, the functionality in GitHub to uh, create a template license files, I think that's great. It leads to a lot more people putting licenses on their file, um, on their repo. But um, you can just see here, for example, I, I was uh, creating a, a default one for which license? Oh, the BSD3 clause. And now by default, the, the copyright owner is going to be my name. Uh, and in the event I didn't put my name uh, with my GitHub account, it would just be my cryptic user ID. Um, now, now this isn't the end of the world, but it's certainly not ideal. What we'd like this to be is Cisco's, uh, Cisco Systems um, Inc. and its affiliates. So just a very simple change, but we have to let people know don't take the default, you know, put this in instead. And, and then people have, have tended to do the right thing, but until we made it obvious to them, um, this got messed up a lot. Now, the, the point that I do want to spend a little bit time, though, on is uh, this corporate license challenge. And uh, if any of you who work at large companies, uh, you probably run into this. Not all the code that we want to share um, really can be open sourced. Uh, either because uh, it conflicts with our business strategy to open source it, or I guess we could open source it, but it's not really appropriate because it's, it's only useful to paying customers because you can't, make, you can't use it unless you're paying us for access to the, the web service that has the APIs, that supports the APIs or something like that. So it doesn't really feel right to open source that and then say, oh, but you have to pay us. Um, so we wanted a way to share this code and make it easy to do that, but without discouraging people from open sourcing code uh, when, when possible and when it is the right thing and without confusing the community. So we came up with this Cisco sample code license and it is uh, not an open source license. There are restrictions. It has to be, it can only be used with Cisco products. Um, it's not meant to replace open source in any way, but what this did was it empowered our community to share code very quickly and easily with, with the community, right? And code that they wouldn't have been able to share otherwise or that would have required negotiating a license that would have slowed things down. So now we can put it out quickly. And what I'm actually finding is in a lot of cases, people will put stuff out quickly using this license. And then if there's interest, we can actually go back and uh, relicense it with an appropriate open source license. Um, so it's, it, it's kind of a, a speed thing for us, too. The, the, the gotcha there being we need to watch out for people just being lazy and open sourcing with this, or sorry, putting code out with this license and never getting back to do the open source when they could. We still want open source to be the default whenever it's appropriate. Okay, I'm going to kind of skip the navigation stuff in the interest of time, but basically when we have all of these GitHub repos, you can think that uh, we wanted to make it easy for people to find code, regardless of whether they were in one of the GitHub repos that I've mentioned or one of those other dozens. So we had kind of a quick and dirty way of doing it using automated tools and APIs. And then we switched to this opt-in method called code exchange. And I've given entire talks on it. If uh, you can just read a little bit about that, but uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna just gloss over this because I don't think it's as important for this talk. And I just want to make sure I have time for next steps. So a uh, few things. You've seen security stressed at this talk. 
it's an area where we know we could improve, especially with those 600 and something odd small projects that don't get a lot of uh, scrutiny in, in many cases. There are security vulnerabilities all over the place in those. Having a way of identifying them and dealing with them more systematically would be great. Establishing and tracking some metrics. We, we don't really do that. Um, I'm going to uh, look for topics, uh, and I'll be going to the uh, chaos con and, and hopefully understanding a little bit better how to do that. An audit process, that would help us a lot because we're really good about making sure a repo um, only gets created and added into our GitHub org if it's appropriate. But then you need to make sure it's still appropriate over time and figure out when it's maybe you should archive it. Um, then I want to take this governance that I mentioned that we've applied to a couple of our GitHub orgs and see if we can apply it more broadly across all of Cisco. And because uh, I think we've, gained, we've learned a lot from it. And I think in general, uh, those other uh, GitHub orgs could, um, could be improved. And we'd probably learn more from talking with them, too. And then lastly, uh, you know, we want to make it easier to um, contribute to open source within Cisco. We've done a lot of uh, improvements in this area already. One area we have not um, tackled yet is recognition. And so there's a lot of people doing great things with open source and Cisco, and I feel like they're not getting recognized or rewarded for that enough. We reward people for patents and things like that. We, we don't really reward them for open source. So um, it'd be really good to, uh, to make some improvements there. Uh, with that, I think I used most of all my time, um, but we may, there may not be a session after me uh, if you have any questions. And I'm certainly you know, happy to stick around. But any quick questions? Any suggestions of things I can, uh, that you're like, ah, wow, what he was saying was a good thing. We, we need to know something even better we should do. Or, you know, I, I'm looking for, for other suggestions for improvement to help add to my next steps. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. You know, like, um, the GitHub provider for Terraform is pretty solid. So you can start doing GitHub for some of your GitHub configuration, essentially. Um, so if somebody needed to create a repo, they just open a pull request. So ah. you think about, instead of like, hey, I need to talk to... Instead of sending us an email, they can do it with a pull request. Kind of stuff, nice. GitHub to manage GitHub. Feels a little more uh, developer-friendly, too. So. Um, fantastic. Well, thanks. I'll look into that. All right. Well, thank you all very much, and I look forward to the rest of the conference. Hope you enjoy it, too.